Good day, everyone. My name is Terry Martin with Napsig Foundation. Thanks so much for joining us today. We're gonna to get started in just a, a couple minutes. In the meantime, I wanted to go over just a few logistical items. This session is being recorded as you've likely heard as you joined and will be made available on our website. For that reason, and due to the sheer number of folks in attendance, uh, your lines have been muted. So for questions, we'll be using the Q&A feature within Zoom. We would definitely like to encourage you to use that. Feel free to start typing in your questions throughout the session as they come to mind. Panelists will be typing their responses throughout. And if there's time at the end, we'll select a handful of questions that we'll try to cover live. Um, additionally, I have Jared Doak on the line from the NAPSIC team that will help me monitor the chat and be available for some general questions as well. So before we get to our presentations, I would like to give our panelists an understanding of our audience today. If you could please take a moment to answer a couple of quick questions about GIS and your organization, you can either scan the QR code or go to menti.com and enter the code shown on the screen. Our team is also posting the direct link to the chat. So lots of ways to get to the Menti questions. Um, we'll check on those results in just a moment. All right. So uh, I'm gonna go on camera here just for this intro part to get us started. Here is a quick look at our agenda today. We have a stellar panel of speakers that will be sharing their work and knowledge with us, starting with a presentation on the use of GIS and a local response to the tornadoes that formed from the remnants of Hurricane Ida. And then we'll hear from the sources themselves for the imagery that Joni and her local emergency management office leveraged so that you will all know how to access these resources as well. I will do a more formal introduction before each of their sections, but first I wanted to just briefly talk about NAPSIG, who we are, and our goal for hosting sessions like this. So for those of you who may be new to our organization, NAPSIG is a 501c3 nonprofit organization. We have a national network of over 20,000 members, both public safety and jazz practitioners alike, representing all levels of government, private sector, and academia. We were formed about 15 years ago as an alliance between a number of prominent national associations on which you see here and have evolved into a formal organization over the course of that time. So our mission is to improve the safety, resilience, and well-being of our communities and to improve government and non-governmental organization responses to chronic and emergent public safety threats and incidents. And we do this through these three pillars, advancing the use of geospatial, fostering adoption, bridging gaps. So, but practically speaking, how do we work to fulfill that mission? Well, largely through defining and promulgating the consistent use of best practices. And we do this through the development of national guidelines and standards. We work to encourage and foster collaboration. We do this through regional exercises and simulations. This also helps us to document challenges, what works well, and then to further validate or update guidance based on those activities. Additionally, through education training, like we're doing today, we aim to build the capacity of the community, sharing examples of great work and lessons learned from locals like Joni, and amplifying the availability of resources like JIC and CAP that can aid the public safety community in future. Finally, we work to transfer that knowledge and skills to community, and we do this through direct help, video and written tutorials, toolkits, and so on. And so I mentioned we have about a 20,000 member network, mostly in the US, but certainly across the globe. You can see from the map here who we've had registered for the webinar. Um, we have a good cross section of the country, a mix of disciplines, levels of government and private sector, which is really good as we're trying to kind of bridge the gap and work towards cross discipline and agency information sharing and coordination. So finally, fingers crossed, I wanna go back and see if we're able to see our results. I'm sure we're all interested in understanding the prevalence of GIS and the level of integration in other agencies and if it's similar to what we experienced in Operate or not. Um, so for the first question, does your organization have access to statewide emergency management GIS coordinator? Uh, this is split. This is quite interesting. So 21 say yes, um, same number aren't sure, and then seven say no. Okay, something to work on. Uh, let's see if I can go to the next one. To what extent is GIS included in your organization's emergency response? So we have folks that are still answering and I'm not sure if it was delayed because I hadn't clicked on the slide yet. 
So it looks like there is kind of a mix here of whether someone's actually dedicated all the time or part-time um, or only during a disaster. So I think um, that will be kind of interesting, particularly for our speakers today. That is actually a perfect lead in to our first presentation. So Joni Appel is the GIS analyst for Anne County's Maryland's Fire Department. She is the primary GIS support for the Anne Arundel County Office of Emergency Management and is an active member of the Maryland Incident Management Team. She was deployed to assist with the Midwest floods in 2019 and the Oregon wildfires in 2020. Joni has an MS in urban and regional planning from the University of Wisconsin and a post-bachelorette certificate in geographic information systems from Penn State. When she isn't teaching firefighters how to use her tech, Joni enjoys sailing competitively and mountain biking. And as a fellow Marylander, I love that this is uh, what you do. So with that, Joni, I will turn it over to you. Thank you, Terry. Let's start sharing my screen. So I have to admit, I was more than a little confused when Terry approached me about essentially copying a presentation I did to a local group for this nationwide presentation, because what we did wasn't really exceptional. It was just what I managed to do while supporting my EOC, literally working from home during this event. And then I realized, well, I, I guess that's the point is this is a very attainable use of GIS by a very small shop that did not require a ton of assistance and IT, and it was not a heavy lift, but it still had a very large impact for our region. So as Terry said, I work for the Anne Arundel County Fire Department, but during activations, I get switched over to our Office of Emergency Management. I also do a lot of special projects with them, so I have a really nice working relationship with all of that staff and the director, which is extremely helpful during events like these. So if you're not familiar with Anne Arundel County, we are in the Chesapeake Bay, just south of Baltimore and to the east of Washington, DC. It's not very uncommon for us to have the remnants of hurricanes, tropical storms come through our area. Generally, they're really just a rain event with high winds and we'll do a partial activation to get ready for you know, trees coming down on power lines and roads that are being inundated. Depending on the track of the storm, sometimes we have a coastal flooding issue, other times that's uh, we have the exact opposite, all the water gets pushed out of the bay. So we were thinking Tropical Storm Ida, it's just gonna be our typical activation. We're gonna monitor road closures, some power outages. It's not gonna really be a high impact event. Because of COVID, we started doing our activations remotely. That's what we were planning to do. We were gonna activate around noon. Most of us are working from home. The National Weather Service did issue a tornado watch that morning, which occurs not too infrequently in this area. So we had the web EOC event created, everyone's logged into that. All of our EOC reps are working from home or in their home agency, like uh, Public Works had their dock activated. So they had folks there in person. We have a standard EOC dashboard that we share out to all of our stakeholders, including our volunteers. And I'm gonna show that to you later but we were just kind of ready for a typical easy wind event. And around 2 p.m., two hours after we started our activation, Ida changed her mind and she decided that it was gonna be a much more impactful event than we were planning. So we started to notice a lot more road closures and some more power outages than we were planning for. And then 911 started to get a little more active. And then we had a tornado warning pop up in Edgewater which uh, happens to be where I live, where I was working remotely. And that kind of started to change everything. So we started to get images like this into our EOC and it became very quickly apparent that this was not gonna be a easy, typical hunker down for a tropical storm event for us. This house was actually picked up and moved off its foundation and it was only about six months old. 
And this house had its entire roof just completely ripped off of it. And these were not isolated incidents that were occurring. So you still able to see my screen? Yes, okay. So I mentioned this dashboard that we share out to all of our stakeholders. This is a simple ArcGIS Online dashboard that is effectively set to public. So I can send this link to everybody when we set up our WebEOC. I add that link in WebEOC. And then I can also, uh, we have an open Zoom call during remote activations. Every time everyone comes together to have our brief, brief outs, I link that Zoom or that um, dashboard into the Zoom call so everybody has access to it. You don't need a special login, but it's not something that is made available to the public. So this is actually live right now. So it's showing our power outages. Luckily, we don't have a lot of power outages right now. And this is actually linked directly to our state has a uh, service for all the power outages in the state, which is really, really handy. And it's generally more reliable than the power company's website because it's not getting hit by all the public trying to see when their power is gonna come back on. We also manage road closures. We're changing our system for that to have something a little uh, easier to use. And that's kind of exciting. Uh, I like to have weather warnings. So you can just you know, pop onto this page, see if there's any weather warnings. Right now we're apparently under a coastal flood advisory and you can click on that and you can go to more information. That'll take you to the National Weather Service to get more information. So as this event was unfolding and we started to see all these images of damage, I was able to leverage the fact that I work for the fire department and I went into our CAD dispatch system and I, I was able to pull out all of our calls from 1400 to 1600 that day. And I, I pulled them right at 1601. And I very quickly went through and go, okay, all these nature codes are probably going to be something that is related to storm damage or a potential tornado. And as you can see, we have a clear line that has started to form right here of people who have called 911 blue is police and red is fire. One thing you'll notice is we have the city of Annapolis here. Something that makes us unique is we have a jurisdiction inside our jurisdiction. The fire department does a uh, dispatching for the city of Annapolis. So I was able to pull all of our fire department calls as well. And it gave us a really quick idea of where our damage was and where we needed to start focusing on right away. Another thing we started to do is come up with, okay, this is where the damage is. Where are we gonna have to start setting up facilities like family assistance centers? We saw all that damage up in Annapolis. We threw a family assistance center up there. We had all the damage down here. We said, you know, let's let's do it. Do another one down here in an area called Woodland Beach. We started talking about you know, right away. We need to get dumpsters out for people because there's so much debris we have to take care of. Let's get these planned now that we have time. We were able to just throw those on a map and have everybody instantly have access to where we wanted these facilities to go. We were also able to pull up aerial imagery to make sure that the place where you put that dumpster, everybody in that neighborhood could, could access it and there weren't fences or other barriers in the way to being able to get to those. Another thing we were talking about is you know, how do we get a better idea of where this widespread damage is? And because I had the ability to be an EMAC to other states, I worked in Kansas where they have a really great relationship with their civil air patrol. And 
I was able to say to my director, you know, have you considered using the Civil Air Patrol to go out and just get a quick snapshot of what type of damage we're dealing with? And she said, hey, that's a great idea. So working with the state, they got us in contact with our local Civil Air Patrol, and we were able to have them the next day up in the air flying imagery for us. And what we did is we put together this map using our damage and our, our calls for 911 service. This is where we thought the potential tornado path was. And we were able to provide that information to Civil Air Patrol and they used that when they were designing their flight plan. At the last minute, someone from Public Works goes, hey, you know, we've got all these assets uh, just south of Annapolis. Do you think you could have them go and take extra pictures of those for us just so we can see if there was damage there? We were able to throw it on a map, they confirmed the locations, and we were able to send it right off to Civil Air Patrol. Additionally, with the jurisdiction and the jurisdiction, since we were already having Civil Air Patrol up there, we had them fly Annapolis, and then we were able to just share all that information with them. So as the incidents unfolding, the data we're starting to collect has the potential to start getting to be something that we don't want the public to always accidentally have access to. So at that point, I built a story map using a kind of an older template that Esri has that I'm, allowed, that I'm able to add different website tabs into. And this story map, it's AGOL. We made it so you had to have a login to get into it. And because many of our you know, directors and our executive, county executive, they don't have AGL account logins. So we created an incident specific login that we could share with the stakeholders who needed to have access to this information. And why did we lock it down? Well, you really don't wanna be advertising where all the damage is that's occurring because looting can become a problem for an incident like this. So to make it a one-stop shop, I added in our EOC dashboard as that first big tab. So everything was still in one place. You had all that information there. Civil Air Patrol went out. They met me at the airport near my house, gave me an SD card, and I was able to download all the pictures they took. And the first thing I did was pick up the phone and call my guy in Kansas and say, hey, can you remind me how to do this? And I was able to build through a story map, essentially a photo viewer that automatically geocodes the photos based on the location of where they were taken. And this was a fast way to share a lot of data. The size of the photos that they gave me was intense. And so there was no way I could easily just email these photos out to people. So by being able to just throw them on a map, and then making it something web-based, all the decision makers had access to really quick, solid information and could see what was going on. We also created a story map just for the city of Annapolis to get it into their hands quicker so they could see the damage themselves while I was working on getting the actual raw data to them so they could do what they wanted with the information. Civil Air Patrol mentioned to me when they were in the air that they weren't the only plane up there that was collecting imagery. And I thought that was interesting. And a couple of days later, I finally figured out that mystery of who else was up there. We were sent an email by the Maryland Department of Emergency Management about this thing called JIC, Geospatial Insurance Consortium, who we'd never heard of before. And they were apparently one of those groups up there that was flying. And they connected us with one of my co-hosts and he gave us all the login information we needed to access this fantastic imagery of the damage that occurred in our jurisdiction. And they provided it to us free of charge. And it was really beautiful, high resolution imagery. In addition to sending us this data, they gave us this really great 
detailed inf inf information and instructions on how to create a secured service in ArcGIS Online or Portal Enterprise to view the data that they were giving us. The nice thing about it was it, if you use the ArcGIS Web Builder Oblique Viewer widget, you're able to get oblique aerial imagery. So you're not only just looking at an aerial, you're able to look at the damage from the side. And that definitely tells you a very different story when you can actually see everything at that angle. I made the decision to build this into a portal environment because then I could share it with anybody in my county's jurisdiction and they were able to just log in using a single sign on and have access to it that way. I didn't have to share it outside of our county. So that's why I decided to keep it as portal. So we were getting a lot of information, a lot of great imagery, a lot of pictures. So then the formal damage assessment is starting to go on as well. So we have the formal damage assessment and the informal damage assessment. So right away, we have inspections and permittings out there. So we have our IMP folks who are out there and they're with pencil and paper, <laughs> And they're reporting it out during our meeting or you know, every two hours having a meeting, they're reporting it out manually. We also had our fire marshal's office there. They were sending me emails with where there was damage. And then we had Red Cross comes out and they do their own damage assessment. Uh, best we could get from them was an Excel spreadsheet of where the damage was, um, but we had to start going, well, okay, we really know where all this damage is, but we're gonna have to go out and do a more formal FEMA damage assessment. So we took all the damage that we had the, you know, from the Red Cross and from our own folks, and we put all those together, put them all on a map, and then we came up with a plan of zones where we were gonna send teams out. This was about two or three days after the incident. So we sent teams out, we broke them into four different teams. They each had an area. We didn't give them the address of where we had the damage reports because we didn't want them to only focus on doing a formal assessment on specific properties. If they saw damage, we wanted them to grab that assessment. So we used the Connect FEMA damage assessment form where you're able to just download it through Survey123 Connect, not the online version. We didn't make any changes to it. And I learned that out in Oregon that you really don't wanna change your damage assessment forms if you're gonna to have to share them with other jurisdictions because trying to stitch together multiple damage assessment forms especially when you're already stressed out is a special kind of nightmare. So we set our teams out. We had a just-in-time training in the parking lot on how to download the app, how to use the app. We created a QR code that people could take a picture with with their phone to get that app onto their phone and have the correct survey to go out. And so we sent them out to do the damage assessment. And we're able to get all of that on a map and have all that information available to our county executive and all of our other decision makers. One other really cool thing we did, and we, this was a lesson we learned from a prior incident, is in our pocket, we already had a citizen damage survey. So this is a survey where it's just sitting there waiting to be used. And when we have a widespread incident, we're able to put it out on social media and the county website saying, if you have experienced damage from this flood or this storm or this tornado, please go fill out this form so we have a good idea of where the damage is. And we had full support by all the departments to send this out. An interesting thing because of the city of Annapolis, they had their own form 
some people didn't know which form to fill out. And because we have a great working relationship with Annapolis, they're using the exact same survey we are. So we can easily trade that information back and forth if we have to. But they also added a ward lookup tool to theirs so someone could determine whether or not they actually live in the city of Annapolis. And if they didn't, they included a link to our survey. So we just pulled all that information in and we're including a link to their survey in case someone realizes, oh, okay, no, this, this is the wrong place to be. And that's just a great example of really knowing your neighbors before the incident and working with them to kind of head off problems before they begin. So we let this stay open for, I think about 10 to 14 days and actually had a, a pretty fair amount of responses to it. There's definitely some cleanup, uh, we call it Null Island, where someone might not have gotten their location correct in the map, but survey one, two, three, the web version makes it really easy to go back and just type in that person's address and move that point to the correct location. And I definitely started to farm out some other IT folks to help monitor that for me because this incident started to drag on and be a lot for one person to, to try to manage. Because you can't control the information that people put into a web form, this was definitely something that we needed to have locked down and not shared publicly, just in case PII started to show up in there. So we created a link in the story map where we could see it happening in real time where people were submitting this information and you could click on it and get more information. This is an archived version, but the live version, you could actually look at the citizen submitted photos. And we had all the information you need to fill out. And wow, it was live. It was like, we were able to see, are these surveys where we had to take immediate action? And then we were able to prioritize people who were having serious issues as opposed to someone who you know, had their had a tree fall in their pool versus someone whose house was no longer habitable. And it was a really great tool to help prioritize where we were putting all of our resources. So, you know, we definitely learned a lot from this incident. Um, much of what happened was being driven by one GIS analyst who was working out of her house, who had the advantage of having a really good working relationship with a lot of the departments that were involved in the activation. We definitely learned some things where, you know, we don't have a great process right now for an initial damage assessment during an event like this. We had so many different agencies out in the neighborhoods collecting information. And when something like this is unfolding, getting emails and verbal reports are really hard to try to synthesize and turn into something usable for all the decision makers. So going forward, we need to work on having a really robust, you know, quick survey one, two, three damage assessment that not only is in our back pocket and ready to go, but we have personnel who are trained in how to use that technology. One of the things that's great, uh, we have an emergency management director who is really, really forward thinking and open to using and trying new technology. And we have an entire county that supports that. And I think that was one of our biggest keys to success is when you're coming up with all of these new technologies and new ideas, the fact that you have all the decision makers behind you and supporting you to do this, I think is an absolutely fantastic and very important asset that uh, Anne Arundel County is definitely lucky enough to have. So unless uh, there are any 
big questions, I think that is uh, the bulk of my presentation. Awesome. Thank you so much, Joni. Um, I know we're actually doing good on time, but uh, I think what we'll do is um, not jinx ourselves and save uh, questions for the end, but there are some really good ones in the Q&A if you want to um, answer them there during this second portion of our session. Um, I am super excited that you uh, have an awesome uh, EM director that is a GIS champion in your um, corner. That's great. I think I wrote down all these gems that you kind of sprinkled throughout your presentation. You know, you had apps and dashboards already teed up. Um, you were able to seek out data that could support the questions and leader, that leadership had and serve it out in really clear apps that met the need. Um, you talked about knowing and collaborating with your neighbors before disaster, not changing the FEMA survey one, two, three damage assessment form, and then like considerations for, you know, maybe what you should and shouldn't share publicly. Uh, JS folks, we are naturally sharers. We want to spread uh, data all over the world and give it freely. So sometimes it's good to have uh, those kind of considerations ahead of time. And then how you were able to easily give access to these products for your decision makers. Um, so kudos, wonderful job. Thank you so much. Um, so with that, uh, I think I will get to our next presenter. Uh, and just to kind of follow the timeline of your response, um, we have John Desmaris, uh, the Director of Operations for Civil Air Patrol at National Headquarters. John leads a large team of volunteer and paid staff in the uh, CAP National Operations Center, the National Technology Center, standardization and evaluation, operations training, special missions and health services, all supporting CAP operational missions nationwide. John has been involved with CAP operations in varied uh, capacities since joining CAP as a volunteer in December of 1987, has been a full-time employee for CAP NHQ since May of 95, and has been the director of operations since December 2012. With that, I will turn it over to you, John, to share a little bit more about CAP and how folks can leverage your amazing capabilities. Great, thanks, Terry. Uh, you hear me okay? I am, loud and clear. Great. And it, so uh, obviously that you've got my my bio here and that everybody and you've got my name. So I'm going to take my ugly mug off the, the, the screen there. Uh, but uh, we'll let it go through the, the slides pretty quick here. So, uh, you know, we're going to talk quick resources and capabilities on the CAP side of things a little bit about CAP for those of you that don't know much about us. Uh, you know, CAP's uh, been around it since December 1st, 1941. We're actually a nonprofit corporation chartered by Congress. Uh, with three missions. You know, you probably will know us primarily for this emergency services mission for search and rescue, disaster relief, homeland security. We also do some drug interdiction stuff. We also even support the, uh, ROTC, junior ROTC with orientation flights. But that's not the only things that we do in our mission. We actually have a cadet program. I actually joined as a cadet myself. Uh, that's how I started in CAP. Uh, so we have you know, thousands of uh, children across the, the country that are involved in our programs. Uh, that they join CAP as young as 12 years old and can actually stay in it until they turn 21 as cadets. Um, and a lot of them, like me, become adult members and, and continue on. Uh, we also have an aerospace education mission. Uh, that mission is actually set up that, uh, to that support both internal and external. That, uh, you know, these days, a lot of effort you know, going towards you know, the, the varied challenges in aviation you know, with you know, getting you know, developing pilots as well as engineers and uh, the varied you know, programs, a lot of STEM focus, you know, those sorts of things, you know, great activities for our cadets and for youth in general. Uh, it, so when you look at CAP, though, Understand that you know we are always Civil Air Patrol, that nonprofit corporation chartered by Congress under Title 36. But most of the support that we probably provide operationally is actually as the Air Force Auxiliary. That ends up being like 85% of our operational missions are done that way. And that's under Title 10. So they, and that, but that doesn't mean that they're everything done as an Air Force side mission is actually funded by the Air Force. Anytime that we're working for a federal agency or when there's federal interest we actually support the Air Force Auxiliary. And one of the main things for you is that the resources that we're provided are actually funded through Title 10 to support the Air Force's mission, but then we're allowed to use them to support all of our other missions. So the airplanes, communications equipment, vehicles, all that uh, resources that actually are funded with Title 10 and are allowed to be used under Title 36. 
So what else do we do? Well, you know, it kind of runs the gamut. You know, we do a lot of training every year because we don't know where every event is going to be, but we support a lot of things, you know, air defense intercept training, a lot of low level route surveys for the military. We actually uh, simulate the remote piloted aircraft in some cases for exercises with a few airplanes that we have. We also have NID um, missions where we're escorting remote pilot aircraft for the Air Force between NID and uh, restricted areas. Uh, it, then lots of orientation flights, oh. you name it, and it, lots of different missions going on every day. So. But bottom line, we have a lot of resources to, to really help you. That, uh, you know, a lot of members that are dedicating, you know, we've got uh, close to 57,000 members across the country. <laughs> Probably about 36,000 of them are really involved in our operational missions, though. And our cadets do get involved in it as well. So that, like I said, you know, we have cadets that range in age from 12 to 21. A lot of our older cadets are actually getting qualified to do operational missions. And even some of those oldest cadets that are actually qualified mission pilots and crew members. Uh, so they get involved in a lot of our different activities. But we've got a lot of resources that we bring to bear. I'm not gonna focus on a lot of these here today, but they, I do have a couple slides on sensors since obviously the main focus of the discussion here is taking pictures and, they, and how do we use that imagery. So what kind of things can we do for you? Well, we have wing mounted action cameras like GoPros that we have on the, a lot of our airplanes across the country. We're actually focusing on it, trying to have about it, uh, 150 to, to 300 of them across the country over time here and, uh, and having additional aircraft set up to be able to move them. Uh, but we also do a lot of imagery using the handheld cameras. And it, a lot of that was done that for some of these missions that were discussed already. But we also have higher end sensors. They, we've got these Waldo XCAM Ultra 50s that, that collect high resolution imagery. We've also got some aircraft now equipped with flare sensors. Uh, it, you know, we also have some airplanes that have sensor balls worth more than the airplane. Uh, you know, we've got that surrogate remote pilot aircraft that we talked about where they're simulating the, you know, what the, an MQ-1 or an MQ-9 does for the Air Force they, that are used around the world. Uh, but it's not just airborne assets, the, you know, it, uh, in the traditional sense. We also have a lot of small unmanned aerial systems. Uh, those uh, small UAS, as we call them, they uh, are both, they, uh, we have both copters as well as fixed wing assets. And we're actually the largest owner of the <clears throat> small UAS in the country. Uh, you know, it's a, a huge deal for us. Uh, and, and our small UAS program was actually started uh, out of the uh, disaster request, because in some cases, it actually it is, makes more sense to actually uh, fly using uh, resources like this that when we can't fly traditional airplanes, you may be able to collect imagery close to the ground uh, with an asset flying at 400 feet that we may not be able to fly at 1,000 feet to 2,000 feet like we do in our traditional airplanes. And we have some cases where we're actually doing things out on the ground. You know, it's not all air crews and, the, and the airplanes for us, ironically. You know, a lot of the people that we have involved in our missions are actually out on ground teams. So, you know, we've, we've literally got over 900 ground teams across the country and, and over 1,000 ground vehicles. Uh, and now we're equipping them at, uh, with at, uh, some of these XCAMGs. They think Google Car they kind of set up. So you can collect imagery after a disaster, but you can also put up people with uh, applications on a smart device, you know, handheld phone applications that they've been able to collect things like high watermarks uh, and be able to, have to do the day-to-day the, the -day, uh, types of collections with lots of people out on the ground, in some cases, just from their own neighborhoods. So what does that look like? Well, you know, in many cases, it's collecting lots of imagery. This is actually from the, a little over a week ago uh, this is uh, actually imagery that was collected uh, for a, a tornado at, uh, over Kansas. Uh, and they, this is the, the kind of things that our folks are doing. You know, they, they're uploading that imagery. We standardly upload imagery to the, it, uh, it's called the FEMA Geo Portal. Uh, and they do that through a, a, a custom uploading tool that was set up for us. But then it's freely available to you. Now, part of that, that's done in, for two reasons for us. One is I don't want to be in the business of retaining it. Because, uh, you know, it, I really can't under Title 10, you know, if we're doing this as an Air Force activity, I can't retain the imagery long term, I have to provide to the customer and basically walk away. It, but the other side of that is a lot of this imagery that you need for your responders right away, 
also helps with FEMA and they're looking at the formal presidential disaster declarations. So we want to be able to get that information up to them as quickly as possible so they can help them make decisions to help you. And what does that imagery look like? Well, you know, you were talking about some of the handheld imagery. Well, this is an example from Kansas, you know, where that imagery that went through, they, you know, they were able to upload the pictures like this literally post flight, get it and handed to the responders right away so they could see where is all the damage and where's the track and provide that data. But there's a lot of follow on activity that can happen with this as well. It's not just those handheld images. You know, when you collect high resolution imagery over a large area, like the, the example that we've got here, this was Waldo error imagery that we collected using that X cam sensor. Uh, we flew it over the Arkansas tornadoes last year. It, what they did was they actually used artificial intelligence on this to help with a lot of those assessments and, you know, doing it from a thousand miles away. You know, so you collect imagery that's then stitched together overnight, and then a remote damage assessment is done, and it's fairly accurate. Now, there's challenges with this. You know, if it's not done right away, the longer you wait to collect some of this imagery, the, the worse it's going to be for some of these automated assessments. And the other side of this is that when you start looking at retention of data, you're looking at lots of data. You know, you're talking about uh, gigabytes of data for this stuff. It's not just a, a couple handheld photos. So you, you got to look at it long term for a retention of these things. Now, FEMA is actually hosting this as well, and they are actually building process to try to integrate a lot of the AI process as well. So lots of opportunities going forward for this. But day to day, that uh, you can actually work a lot of these issues the, the, to continue to go forward for missions beforehand. And in many cases, we can do a lot of this in training the, to be able to the, figure out any local kinks, where do you need to collect imagery and what's the, the basics for you? And like I said before, it's not just airborne. You know, they, some of the folks are wondering, well, hey, what does that picture look like from the XCAMG? Well, that's what that Google car kind of picture looks like. We've actually had them for a couple of years. We actually used it with the Puerto Rico earthquake. Hasn't been a lot of opportunities for using these yet though. So they're out there, but just understand we're fielding more and more of these. Our goal at long term is to actually for the, the Waldo air sensors and the ground sensors to have about 60 of each around the country over the next decade. And we're actually close to, uh, to 20 of each right now. Uh, we're actually going through some uh, getting things set up for these things. We're working a lot of documentation issues, but you'll see more and more of these getting fielded to you. Uh, and out, out in the, the field available to you. Uh, so there's lots of things that can be done that, to try to, to help you. So to how do you request assistance? You know, it, uh, it, bottom line for us generally, you can do one-stop shopping and call our National Operations Center. Uh, I'm actually standing in it right now. Uh, our op center is actually at, uh, at Maxwell Air Force Base in Alabama. Uh, it, it, we're, it, uh, we actually it, uh, have our full-time staff here. Uh, and they're available toll free 888-211-1812-247. Uh, we actually have staff in here during normal business hours and then it rolls to a duty hour, uh, officer after hours. Uh, but during big events, sometimes we'll, we can stand up to 24 seven when we need to with augmentees. But I'll tell you, there's generally a disaster going on somewhere just about every day. So most of the time with the normal battle rhythm for things that uh, our staff can make and uh, handle things day to day. Now, it, just realize that we can also get requests in other ways. We do get requests that actually come to us from other federal agencies, like FEMA can actually do mission assignments directly to us. Uh, we can also uh, work a, a lot of uh, work through the Department of Defense and other federal agencies and they can get kicked over to us. Uh, but bottom line, most of those missions that we do for disasters, they, uh, they start local and, they, and then work their way up. So, uh, a lot of those events, they, you know, we support typically, you'll see about 75 disasters a year. Uh, and they, in a typical year, probably a dozen to 15 of them end up as mission assignments with FEMA. But a lot of them actually get done in support of state and local agencies. Now, you don't have to have a, a memorandum of understanding with Civil Air Patrol beforehand to make those requests. You can actually they, they work they, with us and send a request to our op center. But obviously, it, it's better in most cases to actually have an agreement in place uh, and have a lot of those things worked out beforehand as to what missions they're going to come our way or not.
And obviously, nobody likes to be passing business cards during the disaster, but they, we want to be able to support you. So I would encourage you know, folks, if there's a, an interest in, the, in working with our people across the country, we're glad to help. And they, our folks are available, uh, but they, we can definitely look at the, any of the long-term mission support as well and, and try to make that happen. Uh, so I think I'm about at my time frame here. So I wanted to uh, basically, if there's any questions, please feel free to put them up in the chat. And I know I've got several of my folks online. They may be starting to answer some of these, uh, but we're happy to try to answer more of them down the line as well. So I think we're going to be skipping over to our next presenter. Awesome. Thank you, John, so much. It's funny, you mentioned what a large cadre of CAP members there are. And to your point, it looks like we do have quite a few in attendance today. So I know we asked you to cover a lot in a short period of time. I do hope this gave our audience a better sense of CAP capabilities, particularly some of the advances with AI and the resources that CAP can bring to bear, and also some really great guidance on what to do to form that relationship with your local wing and get those agreements in place now to enable folks to work readily with CAP during emergency. So thank you for sharing all of that with us. With that, I would like to introduce our final speaker, Richard Butgreit is Director of Catastrophe Response at the Geospatial Insurance Consortium, or JIC, another close partner and amazing resource to the community. JIC is a not-for-profit consortium between the insurance industry, National Insurance Crime Bureau, and Vexel Imaging. After disasters, Richard leads collection of high-resolution aerial imagery to assist JIC members in claims processing and to fight against fraud. Recognizing the value of these images and benefits of cooperating with public safety stakeholders, JIC provides access to the images at no cost and with no obligation to these stakeholders. Richard began this position in November 2018, coming from the Florida Division of Emergency Management, where he served as the Chief Information Officer for the Division and Technical Services Branch Chief for the Florida State Emergency Response Team. I will turn the floor over to you, Richard. I forgot to unmute myself. <laughs> <There you go. laughs> um, so I'm unmuted and I'm on camera and you can see my screen, correct? The slides? Yes. Okay. Um, yeah, so first of all, I just wanna say thank you for the invite and the opportunity to present. Um, you know, and what a great, great uh, presentation it's been so far. I just love hearing Joni's stories from this local perspective and uh, so many things there to, you know, learn from and, uh, uh, expand on as, as best practices. Uh, the integration, you know, uh, the integration with emergency uh, information systems like WebEOC, very important to be able to bring these GIS resources into the rest of what you do in those emergency operation centers. Uh, the engagement with the community for the self-reporting of damages. Uh, I love some of her quotes, you know, know your neighbors before the disaster. Um, she really uh, embraced, you know, that quote, never let a good disaster go to waste here. And um, uh, so just a great presentation from that side. And also from CAP, you know, I've been involved with CAP starting back since 2008 uh, there in Central Florida, uh, in Florida, responding to Tropical Storm Fay and having CAP go out and collect geotagging photos, getting those together in a, uh, you know, Google Maps mashup that we had back then. And so to watch CAP uh, continue to grow and evolve and Deepwater Horizon involved with that and the work we did in Florida, you know, we processed over 85,000 geotagged photos during that summer uh, to help us with that uh, ecological disaster to which we were responding to. And even all the way back up with CAP in uh, Hurricane Michael, I was right there again in the Florida State Emergency Operations Center. Uh, the first time they used one of the Waldo air cameras, or the first time I was aware they used one of the Waldo air cameras. And we, um, you know, met the folks from Waldo Air at the Seven Hills Regional User Group GIS Conference and brought them right over to the uh, state EOC to give a briefing in there um, to see the incredible work that's there. So uh, just great to hear from CAP and seeing how they're continuing to lead the way with UAS and ground deployments. And um, I, I do have a challenge though. I want somebody to deploy a hot air balloon, one of those Civil Air Patrol hot air balloons for response. I gotta see that. <laughs> to, uh, um, I wanna see that happen for sure. Okay, so turning back to us in GIC, you got my um, presentation, you got my uh, bio there. And yeah, to be clear, I'm an employee of Vexel uh, Imaging and uh, the Vexel data program that we have, but it's our partnership through GIC, which really brings me to talk today. And I'm gonna go ahead and stop my video too, so we can concentrate on the slides. And now I'm gonna jump into them. So as mentioned, 
Um, you know, five years now, we've been operating the Geospatial Insurance Consortium or GIC or JIC. And uh, it is this uh, <clears throat> partnership between the National Insurance Crime Bureau and Vexel Imaging. Uh, what really enables, uh, you know, the, what I'm about to talk about is the members of the GIC. And so these are some of the insurer members um, here in the United States. And there are more, but not all of them allow us to, you know, share it with you. <laughs> um, but you can visit our site and find out more information about these different uh, members. But it really is because of them and their investment in exactly the same thing you want, uh, post-disaster imagery, um, and how to get that uh, after these disasters for them to use, and then recognizing that the value of it, that we want to share it with others. So yes, we respond to catastrophes with major property impact uh, from tornadoes, hurricanes, wildfires, wind, and flooding. Uh, not all of those are valued the same for us in our responses. Uh, as most people on the call probably know, uh, most of your flood insurance is through the Federal National Flood Insurance Program and not held by our private uh, insurer members. So yeah, we, we don't do all floodings uh, you know, we'll only respond to those by exception at a request by our members. We don't do a lot of widespread wind uh, damage, you know, just the scale. You could go out and have some of these events that could have impact, you know, three, four, five counties with high winds, but not like really create a lot of big damage, like houses completely blown over, just, you know, shingles off here and there, trees down on houses. And those are generally not the kinds of things we're going to respond to. So we don't respond to everything that I know is, you know, of interest to those on the call. Um, but when we do respond, uh, the imagery is available within 24 hours of collection. We're going to have some, you know, highest possible resolution. Generally, we're going to be between 7.5 centimeters to 10 centimeter resolution with our nadir and oblique products. Um, and we, uh, you know, frequently, we're most frequently, why we're doing this is that our GIC members are using the data for safer, speedier claims processing and fraud prevention. But what I want to talk about today, particularly, is that, you know, we partner with emergency management and public safety and can provide access to these images after the disasters to you as well. Here's just a quick run through on, you know, some of the cal uh, calendars of what we've responded to. Most recently in 2020 and in 2021, actually those, those dates are backwards. <laughs> That's 2021. Oh boy, I'm even confused now. <laughs> That's, um, <clears throat> that's uh, yeah, that is 2021. There we go. Only one hurricane, Hurricane Ida. And this is what we've done so far in 20. Uh, that's going back to 2021, 2020, sorry. Um, but just to give you an idea of the scale and the scope of some of the disasters to which we respond to, this is what we've done so far in 2022. Um, you know, tornadoes, fires, definitely hurricanes, the occasional flood. And like we say, when we collect, we can provide the data uh, through services back available to public safety stakeholders and emergency managers. To learn more about us, I don't have a lot of time today, so I am rushing through this. To learn more about us, make sure to visit back uh, our vexeldata.com website, um, you can learn all about, you know, not only our gray sky program, but also our blue sky program, where we, uh, we do fly, you know, commercially available aerial photography and provide that back out to local state government and private sector as well, and the insurance company. And if you're interested in our blue sky programs, you can visit the site for more information. Um, also kind of crunched into this time thing, I want to link out to some other things, like there's this silly video where they made me a um, <laughs> animated character, <laughs> but it is a, 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 an interesting watch to see and give you kind of really the impact of what we do. Uh, there's an insider's look at a week in gray sky collection video that's also been done. When, uh, when we first were talking with Joni, I was like, I recognize the name, but I was having kind of problem uh, fitting it all together. And then it's like, I remembered, oh yeah, that was the day, <laughs> the day when we actually collected in three different regions of the United States. We were still responding to Hurricane um, <clears throat> Ida down in uh, Louisiana. We also flew uh, the fire, the Caldor fire in uh, California 
and also uh, collected imagery over these tornadoes in uh, the Northeast on the same day. So a very challenging time. No wonder I have a little bit of memory issues there. Um, but, uh, you know, a great response from our team and just shows you the capabilities that we have to pull off such a, a response in the same day. There's also a, a racing post-disaster pain is a recent article that came out that really talks about, you know, my personal experience here with the Marshall Fire, uh, where I'm currently living in uh, Louisville, Colorado, um, and how not, we didn't lose our house. We're very fortunate with that. But, um, you know, just seeing firsthand how the imagery that's collected by the, the GIC, how the insurance companies are using it, um, just real, real profound experience for me. Uh, I would invite everyone to visit one of these websites, either, either one you go to, you're going to uh, end up at the same spot, and that's, uh, you know, registering uh, to receive notifications. You can sign up so that you'll receive notification when we collect in your state, and um, then once you see that we collect in your state, you know, reach out to me directly. Uh, is really the best way to do it. <laughs> um, my email address there, and we'll get you access to the services. We're kind of in a little transition from our services. You know, we're providing them through a, a, a ArcGIS portal right now. We will be moving to more uh, support through ArcGIS Online. So, you know, reaching out to me through ArcGIS Online, and we'll be able to get you access to the services. Okay, so that's that's all the slides that I have. Like I say, very short presentation. I encourage you to look back at some of those links that I have uh, provided that um, you know will tell you more about what we do. And by all means, feel free to reach out whenever you want to. Terry, turn it back to you. Awesome. Thank you, Richard. Um, we also asked you to cover a lot in a short time. I know word is getting out about your imagery. We're seeing some comments in the chat from folks who have used it at the local level. I know we've seen FEMA have leveraged both CAP and JIC imagery to rapidly complete visual geospatial damage assessments and even help secure emergency declarations based on assessments from this imagery. So incredibly powerful. For folks who are interested in learning more about anything that we discussed today, please feel free to drop that in the chat for a potential deeper dive session or contact us at the email that we'll share at the end. So I will try to wrap this up quickly and try to keep us on time, but uh, I do have some important announcements and a call to action. There's always homework with our webinars. So your first assignment, review one of our geospatial game plans for a hazard your jurisdiction may face. We lay out resources like CAP and JIC and others when they're available and how to access them. So your second assignment, uh, do not feel like you need to do this hard work all on your own. Other EM staff can be three deep during an activation, right? And as you've heard from Joni and saw in our mentee, this may not be the case in your agency. So meet your state local counterparts. Maryland has a public safety working group underneath their state group, MISJIC. That is actually where um, Joni mentioned, I first learned about the great work that she did in Anne Arundel County um, during Ida. So also, we support FEMA's geospatial coordination calls during disasters. Follow the link that's in the chat to get on that distro list and meet your FEMA regional geospatial coordinator as well. All right, your next assignment, if you are interested in staying up to date with new initiatives or contributing your expertise either in working groups during blue skies or remotely during disasters, fill out this interest form. Jared's adding that to the chat. I'm keeping him busy today. Second to last assignment, check out the crisis communication catalog and please complete the information for your jurisdiction if it's not done already or share with your PIO to complete. This information is critical in apps like FireMappers that currently provide links to authoritative websites, public safety and social media pages, Disseminating authoritative and actionable information during disaster can be a real challenge, and we're hoping to turn this map green and have a complete data set for the nation. Lastly, please save the date for our annual summit. Inspire will be returning to in-person October 25th and 26th. This is a great time for decision makers, public safety practitioners, and geospatial and technical folks to come together. There will be more to come if you're on our distro list, uh, so please keep an eye out for that. And finally, special thanks to our presenters for giving so generously of their time and for being fearless innovators and advocates for geospatial data and tools to support this community. That is a wrap. The recording slides and any Q&A will be available in the coming days, so keep a lookout.
everyone take care and hope to see you soon.